Hi, this is Mick West of Medibank.org. Uh, in a recent video, this video here, I identified some problems with the University of Alaska Fairbanks uh, study, which was carried out by Leroy Halsey and paid for by architects and engineers for 9-11 Truth. Uh, there were five issues that I raised and I found a few more, but quickly let me go over the uh, five that I found before. So firstly was why does this figure not show dynamic analysis? Why does it just instead show this kind of ridiculous uh, tilting over to the side, which is clearly not a dynamic analysis. Secondly, what is the justification for using linear static analysis in this figure, which is clearly showing something that is neither linear nor static? Then what is this animation derived from? Uh, because it is not an actual dynamic analysis. It appears just to be a kind of hand animation made with a bit of simple box physics put in there. So it's not a dynamic uh, analysis, but it's claimed to be one in the report. Then there's the issue of uh, why are they focusing so much on this connection when NIST don't actually use it in their uh, global collapse model, although they use it as a initiating event hypothesis. Hypothesis is not actually used in the global collapse model. And finally, why is uh, why did Halsey say that NIST global model only modeled it partially when in fact NIST global model was fine and they did a partial model for that ANSYS model, which is a different thing. But let's get into the new issues. I found some new problems with Hulse's report, which I think are pretty significant, uh, perhaps even more significant than the ones in the previous uh, video. So let's get right into it. This is Hulse's report. The draft report of his four year long study, which was released on 9 3 3rd of September, 2019. This is the result of a static linear analysis where he's trying to simulate NIST's hypothesis that these three columns failed and that caused the collapse of the building. Uh, this is a plan view, so it's a view from above, and uh, it is floor 413, at least it's identified as floor 13 in the slides, which we'll come to later. And it actually is showing uh, this here, this is the building seven, and the top of building seven, we have the penthouse on one side, and that would be underneath these columns. And you know the penthouse collapses first, so obviously these columns have to collapse first uh, if, if things are to make any sense. So what they did is they took the building itself and they stuck it in a linear static analysis, and this calculates all the loads on the columns. Uh, then they identified these three columns that they're going to remove. This uh, this headline is a bit slightly wrong. This is not the analysis of them being removed, this is before they are removed. So they're removed and then we get to this situation here, loads are redistributed. Then they identify uh, three more columns that they're going to remove because it hasn't collapsed yet. So they figure oh, we'll just take out three more columns and that'll make it uh, collapse. So on the next page, we have the result of what happens after that. These six columns are missing here. So now, all these columns down here are now overloaded. And since they're overloaded, they're removed and the simulation is run again. This is what you do with static simulations. You, you run it and then you see what the loads are on everything. And then if something has failed, you can remove it and then you can run it again. So they run it again and then uh, with these columns removed and it shows that all these columns are now overloaded. And so they obviously they can remove those in the next run of the simulation. So they remove those. Now they, they say the building is tipping downwards. So we get some of these columns, the blue ones here are actually in tension. They're being pulled up rather than being compressed down. All these are overloaded. So they're all gonna fail and then they run it again. And eventually everything uh, has failed and the building falls down. And they say that this results in what we see here. Uh, this results in the building tipping over. Now, the problem is that Halsey, on the same day this report was released, September the 3rd, he did a presentation where he presented the findings of this result and he presented what you see here. But the problem is he didn't actually present the same thing. He presented a different model. Uh, if we have a look at what he presented, let's just kind of go through it and we'll, uh, I'll comment on what we, what we see. So here is uh, Professor Halsey, and he's going to describe then, uh, what's going progressive on. Progressive collapse simulation for NIST assumption. Now here's where we, what we were doing was showing you what we found. What I'm going to do is share with you uh, what NIST said had to happen 
and we're going to show you our the response computer response to that okay so this is Halsey explaining what we just saw in these uh, these slides, you know, slides these uh, figures in the report, uh, how they remove some columns and it caused the building to collapse. So let's carry on and see what happens. The simulation was based on this assumption that column 79 buckled at floor 13, which led to the global failure of the building. The progressive collapse was simulated with the help of static analysis by progressively taking away those columns that failed. Okay, so he says here they progressively take away the columns that failed, which is you know what we see in the report. They, when a column failed, like these columns that are circled in red here, they take them away. So when you take out some columns out, the load's still there. It's got to be taken by something else, right? And so we progressively took them out and took them out and took them out to get a handle on what it looked like. So. Okay, just to reiterate what he said there, when columns fail, you take them out, you progressively take them out, take them out, and take them out, and then the building eventually collapses. Here he's take, taking these out, and then he takes all these out, building collapses. Fair enough. So he's explaining all of this. Then he shows Here's where uh, we this. started with the whole three-dimensional building, and here's what it started to happen by taking them out. So it wasn't... The this is not... Uh, the result of the analysis. This is essentially uh, an animation he set up to demonstrate what would happen if the building tipped over. This is all it's demonstrating. It's not actually demonstrating anything physically. It's just saying if the building tipped over, it would look like a building tipping over. It's just a simple box. It's put some a simple pivot in there somewhere, and it's doing a little bit of physics to rotate the top box around the bottom box. Nothing else. This is not the result of an analysis. This is just a manual visualization of what's going on. But uh, it's kind of an incongruous place to put it in here because we're actually talking about the static analysis. So let's get back to the static collapse analysis. We see. It wasn't the collapse that they showed on their, their computer. But this is what, if you take the story and put it into the computer models, this is what you're going to end up seeing, tilting. Except that wasn't a computer model. That was a manually animated model which is what I was pretty confident I was going to see when on the first day I started this and looked at that centroid issue because I'd done enough high-rise buildings to know that, you know, you, they're not wanting to fail straight down unless they are uniformly distributed. It's kind of an interesting statement. Uh, high-rise buildings are not wanting to fail straight down unless they are uniformly distributed. Uh, well, we'll have to take his word on that for now, but let's just uh, carry on. Straight down. So the analysis was based on this assumption of column 79 buckling mm -hmm. at floor 13. The static analysis started by failing column 79, 80, and 81. And even though the, through the anal analyzed axial forces, it didn't exceed their design load capacity, you're going to see green circles. What I'm getting ready... What he's getting at here is an interesting thing. Now listen to Halsey. Uh, this is a key point in the conversation here, and I think it indicates he doesn't really understand what's going on with his own slides. I do share with you, green circles mean it didn't exceed the capacity. Red circles means uh, the columns exceeded their design load capacity. Okay, so he said there that green circles mean that the column did not exceed its capacity, and red circles means that they did exceed their capacity. And you will notice here there's only three columns that are marked in green and the rest are not marked at all. So obviously that's not quite right. This is just three columns that have been indicated. None of the columns here are exceeding their design capacity yet. But he's marked three columns as not exceeding their capacity. So here we go. There's three columns that did what? Exceeded or did not exceed? See here, Halsey is kind of s slipping into his uh, lecturing uh, role here is trying to teach the students did they exceed or not exceed nothing here is exceeding their design capacity but he's drawn three green circles around these columns for some reason well the reason is that they're going to be removed did not right so we don't see anything happening yet that's true still here is uh, again nothing failed at column 79 80 and 81 were removed but column 76 77 and 80 were removed to initiate progressive collapse Okay, so these columns here, the ones you can't see, 79, 18, 81, will be here. These are the columns marked in green, uh, columns 76, 77, 78. 
So it's removed those to initiate the progressive collapse. I'm not sure what this two refers to. We took them out anyway, all right? Here's a look at the floor system, if you look at it from the side. This actually would be kind of interesting. Uh, it would be good to see this animation. Look at all this detail we have down here. Why don't we see animations of this type of thing going on? Here we say, um, after columns 76 to 81 removed, some of the columns started to fail. So these red ones have failed. These green ones have not failed. In fact, none of these ones over here have failed either, but he's marked these green ones. And it says here, the green circles again signify the axle load didn't exceed the column load capacity, but would fail just to keep the progressive collapse proceeding. This means they manually removed these columns. These are columns that did not actually fail in their simulation, but they manually removed them anyway. This column here did not fail. They manually removed it anyway. These out as you move move forward. So um, <coughs> some of the columns started to fail and were significantly uh, signified by the red. And then uh, the green circles again signified the axle load that didn't exceed the column load capacity. See there, he completely neglected to point out that the green ones didn't actually just mean that. The green ones were indicating the ones that they are manually removed. They manually removed some columns. And at this point, I think it's worth going back to the report and if we look here, what do we see? We see red columns, we see no green columns. In this simulation, they did not manually remove any of the columns. Notice this is um, directly after 76 to 81 were removed. We get the same columns failing. Uh, we get the same columns not failing. However, in Hulse's presentation, this column and these three columns have been manually removed. Whereas here, they have not been manually removed. They actually fail later in the sequence by themselves. Nothing manual is needed. Why is there this big difference? Let's carry on. He's out as you move, move forward. So um, <coughs> some of the columns started to fail and were significantly uh, signified by the red. And then uh, the green circles again signified the actual load that didn't exceed the column load capacity. We keep taking them out, taking them out. Now there's no very quickly slipped over that last slide there. Uh, let's go back to it. So again, all these columns fail, but for some reason they also had to remove these columns. Why did they have to remove these columns? I mean, surely the building is going to collapse if you just left these columns alone, but they manually went in and they manually removed these columns for some reason. Perhaps they removed them to get the result that they wanted. We keep taking them out, taking them out. Now there's no columns left, and there's nothing there to carry the load. And here, uh, by and eventually, of course, we get to a state where pretty much every column has failed, and so they don't need to worry about uh, having to manually remove some additional columns. So you can kind of see the order they did things in. They kind of removed these columns down here, then they removed the ones in the middle, and then they kind of removed the ones over here, uh, which would tend to make the building tip over in this direction. So what more than failing with five, is... it can be seen that it does not match the video. So this. here, the building is tipping southeast. This is a very interesting diagram. Now you might have noticed in the report that we have uh, the same the same diagram. Here it is. This is a similar type of diagram. Let me just uh, bring this in here. So this is the presentation over here, purple. This is Hulse's report. It is not purple, it's purple at the base, and it's multicolored uh, throughout the, uh, the, the entire model. It's also this, uh, this model has three more floors in it than the model in the report, which again is rather curious. He's giving a report, a presentation on a report, and yet he's showing a completely different model. Another thing you'll notice about this model uh, is that it has these weird glitches here, this one here and this one over here. Now this glitch down here, this kind of long kind of tail type thing down here, is actually the reason it's all purple. If you look at this scale over here, this is showing the displacement of everything in the building in inches, like how far it has moved. And if we go back to the report itself, we can see here, this says E plus three, which means 10 to the power of three or times a thousand. And then these are numbers. So this is say 2.1. So this, the one that's moves furthest is this green here, which is about uh, say 1.2 times 10 to the three. So about uh, 1200 inches, which is about a hundred feet, which means that this green 
has moved about 100 feet from its original position, which seems about right uh, based on the angle that we, we see here. It's an angle, I don't know, about 20, 30 degrees, something like that. But yeah, this seems very consistent. So this, this is definitely measuring the displacement in inches of, uh, of this building. But if we go back to uh, this, the slideshow from uh, uh, Hulse's presentation, it's all purple. And if we look over here, it's kind of hard to see, but it actually seems to say E plus 12 which is considerably more than E3. It's actually a billion times bigger. And the numbers here go all the way up to like 23 times uh, 10 to the 12, so 23 trillion inches. And uh, most of the building is purple because most of the building really hasn't moved much more than, uh, you know, well, it's certainly less than one trillion inches, so everything is less than the one trillion inches range. So what's actually happened is this bit here and this bit here have actually been offset by a very large amount, thousands, uh, literally many thousands of feet, if not millions of feet. So there's some kind of weird glitch here. It's all stretched out. It's broken. The, basically, the, the model is broken. It's no good. You shouldn't be using a model like this because the geometry is all messed up. And carry on. It's got like another view like the on the same thing. The building like in a tip mode. And you can see it even more dramatically here. This very long thing that's going down, shooting off to somewhere that's miles down below it, something else shooting off to miles down below it. And then the scale here, yeah, everything's down in the purple, a little bit of red there. So, but definitely things are way off from what uh, is, is real. So, you know, that doesn't match any kind of reality. So this is obviously some kind of broken model that he's using. And we know it's a broken model uh, because of this, because of these glitches, but also because they had to do all these, these strange column removals. They had to actually go in and manually remove the columns to make this model actually work, to make it actually collapse. But later on in the report, they've got a model which they magically do not need to do this. Somehow they figured it all out and they've got a model that actually collapses by themselves. So that means during the course of their study, they had at least two models, one of which Halsey presents in his presentation, one of which they put in their report. If you've got two different models, giving two completely different sets of results, how do you know which is the correct model? And that's why I say this is actually a bigger problem than the previous problems before. It's actually showing that they don't actually have a valid model because if they've got two models, which one's valid? Halsey gave an entire presentation with this messed up model. Is this the right model? Probably not. Is there a model in the, uh, in the report, the right model? Well, it's the model that gives better looking results. So they've obviously tweaked it so it gives better looking results, but is it right? So let's sum up. Uh, the problems with Halsey's report uh, boil down to he's using static analysis this is static analysis, for a dynamic situation. Building tipping over isn't something that you'd use static analysis for because static means that the building isn't moving. And when something's moving, it's colliding with itself. There's all kinds of deformation. Deformation means nonlinear response. And this is a linear static analysis for a situation which is dynamic and nonlinear. You should not have used that to simulate this far into the simulation. It's fine to remove one column and then see how the load gets transferred to the other columns, but you can't show a building tipping over because of this. The next problem is that he doesn't have a dynamic analysis. There's no dynamic analysis. He says he has a dynamic analysis. It says, uh, says so right here, dynamic analysis results. He says this is the dynamic analysis results, but it's not. It is not a dynamic analysis result. This is one box rotating above another box, probably set up very simply in, uh, in SAP 2000 with a pivot point and some mass system and then a little bit of gravity and it just rotates by itself. It's not a dynamic analysis of the building. It's a dynamic analysis of two boxes. It's a dynamic analysis of this top box rotating around the bottom box. It's not the result of a proper dynamic analysis. So they've got a broken static analysis model that they're using inappropriately that has multiple versions that they've tweaked, one of which they had to hand tune to get it to do what they want it to do. And they don't have any proper dynamic analysis. So I think this really raises some serious questions about the validity of the conclusions of Dr. Holsey's report.